Hey everybody, we're going to take a quick look today at a really useful time series econometrics command in Stata, the so-called coregram command that brings up the correlogram, which contains a wealth, a virtual plethora, if you will, of information about a time series variable. So let's take a look at our to-do list uh, for our little video today, talking about this correlogram in Stata. So we'll look at the command how to, how to call up the information, really basic. Uh, and then we'll kind of pick apart what we see in that Stata output, the so-called ACF autocorrelation function, the PACF, the partial autocorrelation function, the Q statistic, uh, and then we'll look at some kind of companion commands uh, that can give us a portion and a little bit more of that same information. So before we get into Stata, right, what is it that we're talking about here? So Imagine we're in a case where we have a time series variable and our goal is to specify an appropriate, ideally an optimal, autoregressive moving average prediction model, typically for the purposes of generating a forecast, right? Well, the first thing you need to know is to what extent and in what circumstances are past values of our dependent variable related to, correlated with, the current value. That is what the correlogram gives us. So, as we'll see, this combines a lot of different sources of information, the so-called ACF and the PACF. So first, some definitions. When we talk about the ACF, the autocorrelation function, that gives us the relationship between the unconditional correlation within that dependent variable. So how do past values correlate with current values and how those correlations relate to the lag, how far back in time we are looking, the lag length K, if you will. So in notational terms, and depending on what book you read, notation might be a little bit different, uh, but we'll have something like this. Tau sub K is the correlation coefficient between YT and YT minus K. And we can calculate that as the ratio of the auto covariance at lag k, gamma k, to the variance, gamma zero. So I'm not going to pick this apart too much, but just note that this is going to be a little bit different from the sample correlation coefficient that we would be calculating. That this ratio of the auto covariance to the variance assumes a constant mean. In other words, not to get too far afield, assumes a stationary process. But that's what we're going to be, we're going to be looking at, okay? So that's the ACF. Well, what else would we want to look at here? The so-called partial autocorrelation function, rather than the unconditional simple correlation, gives us the direct or partial effect of the kth lag of our y variable onto the current value, partial yt, partial yt minus k. Right, so how that differs from the ACF is that it's, again, parceling out or holding constant those intervening lags. So you might see a value of the autocorrelation at lag 5. We don't know exactly what that represents, right? Because what happens at lag 5 might affect lag 4, lag 3, lag 2, lag 1, and there's really no direct influence over those five periods. It's just this cascading correlation. The partial effect will be able to make that determination, right? It will only capture that partial effect, holding those intervening lags constant. So technically what we're going to see the output of is estimating a model, right, like this, where we would just do a, an autoregressive model out to lag k and then calculate the, essentially, the OLS slope coefficient, right, at lag k, and that's partial yt, partial yt minus k. And every time we go back one more lag, we add one more term to that autoregressive, calculate the coefficient, and then report the partial effect. Okay, so that's most of the information that we're gonna see. So let's go ahead and call this up. So let's grab some data can never go wrong uh, going to the 
Federal Reserve Economic Database using the FRED use command once we install it. So we go FRED use and let's grab the monthly observations of the three month T bill yield. So FRED use TB3MS. That will grab the data. So it goes back a thousand observations. And let's generate a time trend variable T equals underscore N. Uh, and then we'll go TS set T. So now Stata knows we're dealing with time series data and we can use these time series specific commands. And let's go ahead and call up the default correlogram. So we just go coregram and then the name of the variable. So that's our TB3MS. And look at all this great stuff that we see here. So this is all based on these lags going farther and farther back in time. So K goes up to 40 here. And the first column, these are the unconditional correlation coefficients, right? And we see a very distinct pattern here, uh, which is something we'll pick apart at a later date. Uh, but we see those correlations very strong, positive, and slowly declining. This, in fact, is a geometric decay consistent with an autoregressive model. But just be able to interpret what these values represent, right? So say at lag 10, we've got that correlation of about 0.91. Well, that tells us the strength of the unconditional relationship between the three-month T-bill rate 10 months ago versus today, lag zero. The next column over is the partial effects. And note they are almost identical, the AC and the PAC at lag one, because there's nothing in between, right, to hold constant. It's the one period effect either way. But after that, we see a very stark divergence, right? So same thing, pick a number, say at lag 10, this negative 0.11 is the partial YT, partial YT minus 10, a negative, direct effect, even though the indirect correlation is strongly positive. Okay, let's skip over to the last two columns here where we have the visual representation, what you might think of as the very low resolution visual representation of the autocorrelation and the partial autocorrelation from left to right. So we range from negative one to one, and we see right, the visual of that slow geometric decay, these spikes, very close to one, but slowly declining as we go back all the way to 40 lags. The partial effects, here we see a positive followed by a negative followed by a positive. We'll dig into that at a later time, but that's indicative of a moving average process. But again, these are just the visual representations of the values here ranging from negative one to one. Okay, so what about these columns here, the Q and the probability greater than Q. So this is the so-called Q statistic, also known as the portmanteau statistic, also known as the uh, young box statistic, also known as the white noise test. Yeah, all of those things mean the same thing, that we're generating a chi-square distributed test statistic that applies to the null hypothesis that some number of autocorrelations are zero. So this is essentially a joint significance test for multiple lags of the autocorrelation. So we can calculate it thusly, and the main point here is that it's a function of the sum of the squared autocorrelations. And again, I'm skipping a lot here, but behind the scenes, if we assume that the variable that we are applying this to is a normally distributed variable, well then, the correlations will therefore be normally distributed, and the squared correlations right, will follow a chi-square. So if we have the sum of these squared correlations, and we're summing m lags, that will follow a chi-square distribution with m degrees of freedom. And how we're going to use this is just asking the question, do we have significant correlation properties? Do past values of our variable significantly influence the current value? So 
at a certain lag length m, the null is that all of those correlations are zero, which would correspond to no predictive power. If you know what happened in the past, it doesn't help you predict what's going to happen now, which would correspond to a random process or a white noise process. A rejection of that null says that at least one of those correlations is not zero. So knowing in the, what happened in the past gives some information about what's happening now, and that's not a truly random white noise process. So that's the easiest way to think about this is it's a white noise test. The null is white noise. A rejection of the null is that we have a, a variable that follows some underlying process. So the next column over that probability greater than Q, well, that, of course, is the very handy p-value, right? Saving us the trouble of having to look up the chi-square critical values corresponding to these calculated statistics. And the rule of thumb here, if we are far enough into the tail of that chi-square distribution, such that the probability the p-value drops below 5%, we can say we have a, a reasonable level of confidence, 95% confidence, in the rejection of the null of a white noise process. So in the case we see here, all of these p-values are zero out to four decimal points all the way down. So wherever you want to apply this test, we'll have a rejection of the null at beyond 1% confidence, therefore beyond 99% confidence that the variable in question is not a random white noise process, that there is an underlying structure to be estimated and exploited for the purposes of prediction. Okay, So lots of good stuff coming out of that. Um, as far as the command is concerned, the only option really that you might want to use is to curtail the number of lags. So the default is 40. Uh, you might not want to look that far back. Uh, so we could specify that, just say coregram the name of the variable comma, and then lags, however far back you want to go, say lags 20. It'll give you the same thing, just a truncated version of it. But the other thing that you might want to do is, because the visual here is not super pleasing to the eye, right, just the kind of the dot matrix version of a graph, uh, we can use the AC and PAC commands separately to pull up a much more a useful visual. So if we do something like this, we go AC and then the name of our variable. Now we get this nice looking graph. So the numbers behind this are exactly the same. We get this nice slow decay. The range here up to 1.0 out to 40 lags. And then we also have this really hand handy visual of the 95% confidence interval, right? So when we pull up the AC and the PAC separately, we can essentially do a lag by lag hypothesis test, right? So if we think about the interior of that confidence interval, all of the, the spikes, the correlations that lie entirely within that area are within 1.96 standard errors of zero, so we do not reject the null that they are zero. The only correlations that we deem to be significant are the ones like virtually all of these that lie outside that confidence interval. Okay. And we can go back and pull up the partial autocorrelation just with the command PAC, and we get, again, kind of that zooming in effect, right? So we see that positive, very strongly positive, first lag, partial effect, then negative, then positive, and then at varying levels of significance, right? So say, for example, these guys here at about lag 20 and 21, we see them kind of popping their heads up above the upper limit of that 95% confidence interval, they would be considered significant partial effects. Whereas these guys here, say at lag 23, 24, 25, they lie entirely within that confidence interval, not far enough away from zero to reject the null of zero, so we would consider them to be zero correlations or insignificant correlations. 
Okay, so obviously just scratching the surface here, but when you bring up that correlogram uh, in Stata, we should now be able to discern where all those values are coming from, what they represent, and then ultimately what to do with them is what comes next in terms of how to interpret these different patterns and how to turn that into an estimated uh, ARMA or ARIMA model. But this is a good start, so let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.